Hello. Welcome back. This is Chicken Philosophy, Telier Desjardins, Part 4. I am your guest host, BT, without the hat this time. Gwydion's on hiatus. And <clears throat> on the Carl Jung portion of Chicken Philosophy, uh, we always pick a rune and put it up on the screen. And I thought that was fun. It's like a fun way to open, but it didn't seem appropriate for Tellier Desjardins. Hmm. So uh, I thought what I might do instead is let fate, let chance decide which frankincense to burn. So I've got this charcoal lit, and we're going to call, if I, I have it, uh, a nine-sided, no, it's a ten-sided die, but see, it's like a and d type thing. But if we roll a zero, then we're just going to roll again, right? So this, uh, if I roll a one, I will light some of this frankincense. Now you might notice it's like dark purplish grayish blue and it's odd. I've burned it once before and it was like disturbingly different. It kind of had a frankincense-ish vibe about it but something else there too. I don't know what it is. I got this in a marketplace in Mapusa, North Goa. So if I roll a one, then that's what I'm going to be smelling while I'm reading it to you, which I, I don't doubt will affect, I mean, beyond just for me, it'll affect my state of mind while I'm reading. This, if I roll a number two, I will, I will burn some of this frankincense, which again, you might be looking at. No, actually, this looks like frankincense. It just looks like very fine uh, grains of it. But I assure you, it's a little different from regular frankincense, also from the same marketplace in Mapusa, North Goa. Sorry about the noises of, no doubt, the microphone being on the table that these are in the drawer of. Now this is number three, frankincense. It's weird. I don't know. I hope, I hope that that yellowness isn't like sulfur. I think I burned it before. These are all very weird, very weird uh, native Indian frankincense. I'm sure there's good frankincense out there. This is odd frankincense. It was also very cheap when I got it. I got it by, obviously, I, I, I opted to put it in these nice um, containers. I think it was given to me in like newspaper, wrapped up in newspaper. So, so we're going hardcore here. Hardcore what? I don't know. This... Oh well, first this is number four, and you know what? This looks like this looks like uh, this looks like frankincense. Um, I seem to remember at some yeah, it smells a little odd. You know, it's I seem to remember going through and burning all of these, and they're all odd in a different way. This is going to be number five. If I roll number five, we will burn the reddish, the reddish frankincense, reddish. And I do wish there was a nose microphone on the uh, camera, but what can you do? You're just going to have to take my word for it. And if I roll a six, we roll the greenish, greenish, yellowish, bluish frankincense. Now, if I roll a seven, then I'm going to crack open this uh, natural resin sampler that I got somewhere. Newton's. It's like a chain grocery store that... It's probably elsewhere in India, but there's two of them here in Goa. And one of these is frankincense. So I'm guessing this is going to smell like regular old frankincense. Um, so that's if I roll a seven. If I roll an eight, I'm going to roll, I'm going to burn a little bit of what's left of the, in, of the frankincense I brought with me from California, which, forgive me for not being 100% sure, I think this came from Mike. Uh, tree Mike. If you're watching, hi. Comment below. Um, I was going to say it might have come, come from Lana, but I think that the bag that she gave me actually had her name or her like brand on a sticker. So, so anyway, this is if I roll an 8, and if I roll a 9... Uh, you know what? I actually have 10. So this... Uh, 
I don't know what this is or what differentiates it from from that. I, it's a mystery. This might have come from that number six, and it might be leftovers from this, but the, the, they're too big. They're too big. I think it must be leftovers from number six or something. I don't know. I don't know why they're in this little cup instead of a jar or a bag. And so that's six through nine. So right, seven, eight, nine. And if I roll a zero, then I will uh, use this, which is some kind of mixture. I put like benzoin oil mixed with something in the frankincense. And so anyway, let's get to it so we can get to the reading. Um, I want to spend all day on this, so I'm rolling it around, and let's see, is there a way that I can do this so that you can see? You can see that I'm being honest. What is that number there? That number there is six. If I recall correctly, that means the green frankincense. <clears throat> okay. Let's see how it goes. I've got the charcoal ready. Just get it in position there. Okay. Green frankincense it is. Wow. All right. Get a little bit of powder. Not powder, but smaller rocks. Ooh, it already smells funky. Funky frankincense. Mm hmm Wow, it's nicer than I remember it, but it's definitely a little weird. I remember the guy was saying, oh, because different, different trees, different chemicals, different something makes it that color. Yeah, it's, it's funky. It's like a cross between frankincense and like, I want to say some kind of weird, not candy, but, and like tires, like, like if you go into a tire store and you smell the fresh tires, like that haven't been used yet. If you go up and just take a big whiff of tire. Mm. That is melted resin on my skin that I'm about to use to read. So hopefully it won't mess up the book. Anyway, I'll sort all this out later when I'm on my own time. Not yours. How's everybody doing? <laughs> I'm just trying to bite the melted frankincense off my thumb. Is there a little much noise pollution? Let me uh, turn off the uh, air conditioning. Lower the volume a little bit on the Jonathan Goldman Holy Harmony. Let's get into some Catholic mysticism, right? The visions of Tellier de Giron, which became popular in the 90s because a lot of it lined up with the internet. The idea being that like, through technology, uh, all us humans will, will be able to connect and share knowledge and that out of that sharing of knowledge, we'll see beyond our differences and, and evolve into some kind of group being that will then become like a Christ consciousness, enlightened kind of thing. And uh, that's the second coming of Christ. Now that's like the, the very like watered down, not watered down, but that's like the the hideously oversimplified version of, of Tillier Desjardins' uh, philosophies, at least how they're generally interpreted. And obviously, that seemed more likely in 1994 than it does today. Um, looking at how the internet, you know, looking at things like Twitter, Instagram, uh, and, and flame wars. Uh, is that even a term anymore? Oh my God, I'm dating myself. That's a 20 year old term, isn't it? Um, yeah, like YouTube and, you know, I mean, it's definitely different from how things were when there were 13 channels on everybody's TV, right? 
and you know it seems like a step in the wrong direction to anybody coming from any kind of naturalist uh, position but uh, yeah I don't know perhaps you know the Lord works in mysterious ways and uh, things uh, maybe aren't what they appear to be so maybe we're in the beginning of the development of this uh, noosphere this uh, Christ consciousness by way of all humans connected on the internet but you know I would suggest don't expect it to come tomorrow if you don't want to be really 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 frustrated all the time so I'm going to go ahead and jump into the reading now so far we've read like the four the not we read the beginning of the foreword not written by Tillier Desjardins and then we also read um, the foreword that was written by Tillier Desjardins and then we read the opening like paragraph that's not actually the opening paragraph if that makes sense and it made reference to there being a foreword written by Tillier de Giron, so we read that. As I was flipping through this introduction, <clears throat> I saw something that I, I think I want to read. Oh, how long is it? Well, it's, it's written by Tillier de Giron, and I, I'm pretty sure this is a, uh, <clears throat> a letter to the Vatican, so that's interesting. I think I want to read that, just to kind of give us a little more background and overview before we actually jump into the divine milieu. So I'm just going to start reading and we'll see where this goes. Cape Town, October 12th, 1951. Very Reverend Father, I feel that my departure from Africa, i.e. after two months work and peace in the field, and parentheses, is a good moment to let you know briefly what I am thinking and where I stand. I do this without forgetting that you are the general, with general in quotes, but at the same time, parentheses, as during our too short interview three years ago, end parentheses, with the frankness <clears throat> that is one of the society's most precious assets, one. Above all, I feel that you must resign yourself to taking me as I am. That is, with the congenital quality, parentheses, or weakness, and parentheses, which ever since my childhood has caused my spiritual life to be completely dominated by a sort of profound feeling, in quotes, for the organic realness of the world. At first, it was an ill-defined feeling in my mind and heart, but as the years have gone by, it has gradually become a precise, compelling sense of the universe's general convergence upon itself, a convergence which coincides with and culminates with, culminates at its zenith in him in, que, in quo omnia constant and whom the society has taught me to love. In the consciousness of this progression and synthesis of all things in, uh, I think it's, yeah, it's in another, Christo Yesu, all things in Yeshua, I'll say, I have found an extraordinarily rich and inexhaustible source of clarity and inner strength and an atmosphere outside which it is now physically impossible for me to breathe, to worship, to believe. What might have been taken in my attitude during the last 30 years for obstinacy and disrespect is simply the result of my absolute inability to contain my own feelings of wonderment. I feel like, is this side, no, I mean, it's, a, it's leaning a little more than usual, but hopefully, now that I've pointed it out, I've drawn attention to it. I'll just, hopefully that's a little better. Okay. Wonderment, where were we? Yes. Mm -hmm. Everything stems <clears throat> from that basic psychological condition, and I can no more change it than I can change my age or the color of my eyes. Two, having made that clear, I can reassure you about my interior state of mind by emphasizing that, whether or no this is generally true of others besides myself, 
The immediate effect of the interior attitude I have just described is to rivet me ever, ever more firmly to the convictions which are the very marrow of Christianity. The unique significance of man as the spearhead of life, the position of Catholicism, as the central axis in the convergent in the convergent bundle, or fascio, which I believe is the root word of fascism, but anyway, um, of human activities, and finally the essential function as consummator assumed by the risen Christ, and this was written after World War II, so that word was a thing and it was associated with Mussolini's referencing that word. Interesting points. I don't know. I'm sure he didn't mean to make that reference or maybe he did. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. All right. <laughs> I'm just pointing out that that word is there and that in the historical context of when this letter was written, it would have been known at that time. Um, that association would have been uh, there. Okay, finally, the, assumption, the, the essential function as consummator assumed by the risen Christ at the center and peak of creation. These three elements have driven, parentheses, and continue to drive, end parentheses, roots so deep and so entangled in the whole fabric of my intellectual and religious perception that I could now tear them out only at the cost of destroying everything. <clears throat> I can truly say, and this in virtue of the whole structure of my thought, that I now feel more indissolubly bound to the hierarchical church and to the Christ of the gospel than ever before in my life. Never has... <clears throat> Never has Christ seemed to me more real, more personal, or more intimate. How then can I believe that there is any evil in the road I am following? <clears throat> so these are things he's saying in response to, like, having a bad reputation in the Vatican. People saying, hey, who is this Tellier de Jordan? Why is he saying all this unchristian stuff, like that evolution is a thing, right? Three, I fully recognize, of course, that Rome may have its own reasons for judging that in its present form, my concept of Christianity may be premature or incomplete, and that at the present moment, its wider diffusion may therefore be inappropriate, inopportunate, inopportunate, right? It is on this important point of formal loyalty and obedience that I am particularly anxious. It is in fact my real reason for writing this letter, to assure you that, in spite of any apparent evidence to the contrary, I am resolved to remain a, quote, child of obedience. End quote. Obviously, I cannot abandon my own personal search. That would involve me in an interior cat uh, catastrophe and in disloyalty to my most cherished vocation. But, parentheses, and this has been true for some months, end parentheses, I have ceased to propagate my ideas and am confining myself to achieving a deeper personal insight into them. This attitude has been made easier for me by my now being once more in a position to do first-hand scientific work. In fact, I have every hope that my, absent, that my absence from Europe will allow the, commu the commotion about me that may have disturbed you recently simply to die down. Providence seems to be lending me a helping hand toward this. What I mean is that <clears throat> the Wenner Gren formerly the Viking Foundation in New York, which sent me here, parentheses, it is the same foundation, incidentally, that refloated Per Schmidt's <clears throat> Anthropos after the war, 
in parentheses, is already asking me to prolong my stay in America as long as I can. They want me to classify and develop the data obtained from my work in Africa. All this allows me a breathing space and gives a purely scientific orientation to the end of my career and of my life. <clears throat> Let me repeat that. As I see it, this letter is simply an exposition of conscious, conscience and calls for no answer from you. Look on it simply as a proof that you can count on me unreservedly to work for the kingdom of God, which is the one thing I keep before my eyes and the one goal to which science leads me. Your most respectful in Xtio Filius, P. Tellier Desjardins. So he had a little bit of a rocky situation going on with the church authorities, as exemplified in that letter. Also, the fact that he abbreviated Pierre as P makes me uh, realize why he's known as Tellier de Jardin. He seemed to refer to himself that way. Now I'm going to actually start reading the actual chapter of the Divine Milieu. <clears throat> Of the two halves, or components, into which our lives may be divided, the most important, judging by appearances and by the price we set upon it, is the sphere of activity, endeavor, and development. There can, of course, be no action without reaction, and of course there is nothing in us which is which in origin at its deepest is not, as St. Augustine said, parentheses, in nobis sine nobis, and parentheses. When we act, as it seems, with the greatest spontaneity and vigor, we are, to some extent, led by the things we imagine we are controlling. Moreover, the very expansion of our energy, parentheses, which reveals the core of our autonomous personality, and parentheses, is, ultimately, only our obedience to a will to be and to grow, of which we can master neither the varying intensity nor the countless modes. We shall return at the beginning of part two to these essentially passive elements, some of which form part of the very marrow of our being, while others are diffused among the interplay, uh, the interplay of universal causes, which we call our character in quotes, our nature in quotes, or our good and bad luck in quotes. For the moment, let us consider our life in terms of the categories and definitions which are the most immediate and universal. Everyone can distinguish quite clearly between the moments in which he is acting and those in which he is acted upon. Let us look at ourselves in one of those phases of dominant activity and try to see how, with the help of our activity and by developing it to the full, the divine presses in upon us and seeks to enter our lives. 1. The undoubted existence of the fact and the difficulty of explaining it, the Christian problem of sanctification of action. Nothing is more certain, dogmatically, than that human action can be sanctified. Quote, whatever you do, end quote, says St. Paul. Quote, do it in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, end quote. And the dearest of Christian traditions has always been to interpret those words to mean in intimate union with our Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> St. Paul himself, after calling upon us to, quote, put on Christ, end quote, goes on to forge the famous series of words, uh, collabor collaborare, compati, comori, co con resuscitare, giving them the fullest possible meaning, a literal meaning even, and expressing the conviction that every human life must, in some sort, become a life in common with the life of Christ. The actions of life, of which Paul is speaking here, should not, as everyone knows, be understood solely in the sense of religious 
and devotional works, in quotes, parentheses, prayers, fastings, alms, givings, end quote. It is the whole of human life, down to its most, quote, natural, end quote, zones, which the church teaches can be sanctified. Quote, whether you eat or whether you drink, end quote, St. Paul says, full stop. <laughs> okay. The whole history of the church is there to attest it. Taken as a whole, then from the most solemn uh, declarations <clears throat> or examples of the pontiffs and doctors of the church to the advice humbly given by the priest in confession, the general influence and practice of the church has always been to dignify, ennoble, and transfigure in God the duties inherent in one's station in life the search for natural truth, and the development of human action. The fact cannot be denied, but its legitimacy, that is, its logical coherence with the whole basis of the Christian temper, is not immediately evident. How is it that the perceptives opened up by the kingdom of God do not, by their very presence, shatter the distribution? You know, this... This, I have to admit, this frankincense, I feel like I've been inhaling um, exhaust fumes directly out of the tailpipe of a car. My, my throat is starting to feel like when we were in Delhi and they were burning all the fields in Punjab and everything was at like a like over 9.99 uh, air quality uh, hazard. So I'm going to open a window real quick. <coughs> Let fate decide whether I can breathe. All right. <laughs> uh, where were we? Yes. I don't know where we were. Distribution out of our activities. How can the man who believes in heaven know? We haven't read that yet. The natural truth and the development of human action. Did we read that? The fact cannot be denied, but its legitimacy, that is its logical coherence with the whole basis of the Christian temper, is not immediately evident. How is it that the perceptives opened up by the kingdom of God do not, by their very presence, shatter the distribution and balance of our activities? How can the man who believes in heaven and the cross continue to believe seriously in the value of worldly occupations? How can the believer, in the name of everything that is most Christian in him, carry out his duty as man to the fullest extent and as wholeheartedly and freely as if he were on the direct road to God? That is what is not altogether clear at first sight, and in fact disturbs more minds than one thinks. The question, yeah, it does. The question might be put in this way. According to the most sacred articles of his credo, the Christian believes that life here below is continued in a life of which the joys, the sufferings, the reality are quite immeasurable with the present conditions in our universe. This contrast and disproportion are enough by themselves to rob us of our taste for the world and our interest in it. But to them must be added a positive doctrine of judgment upon, even disdain for, a fallen and vitiated world. Quote, perfection consists in detachment. The world around us is vanity and ashes, end quote. The believer is constantly reading or hearing these austere words. How can he reconcile them with that other counsel? usually coming from the same master, and in any case written in his heart by nature, that he must be an example unto the Gentiles in devotion to duty. What? what? Do Christians refer to non-Christians as Gentiles? Or did I miss the part where he's talking about Jewish folks? No. No, he's talking about Christians and Gentiles. Okay, I guess it's not as rude as pagans. Um... 
in devotion to duty and energy and even in leadership in all the spheres opened up by man's activity. There is, by the way, pagan used to mean um, like hillbillies, like people who were ignorant of life in the city before Christianity. It was like, oh, those Paganos, you know, or whatever. And then uh, around, you know, of course, St. Augustine, city of God against the pagans. By that time, pagan meant not Christian. Still doing those same things that the rural folk were doing in ancient Rome before, you know, everybody was Christian, right? And so it was just applied to everybody like outside of Rome or everybody outside the Roman Empire was considered pagan. And these days, of course, there's sort of a specific identity given to people who are self-proclaimed pagans. And so on uh, religion charts, you'll see pagan and the qualities of pagan and then Hindu as a separate thing. And I'm like, um, what about when the Catholics came to India and started burning down all the pagan temples that, by the way, were Hindu temples? That, that doesn't count as pagan? All right, whatever. It's a rude term that maybe like people these days, some people have have uh, taken it on as like when Yankee Doodle was a song that the British sang making fun of the Americans and then the Americans won the Revolutionary War and started singing Yankee Doodle and making it a patriotic song. Uh, similar, uh, yeah, Pagan was the establishment referring to everything that's not the, the, the established, what we call the Roman Catholic Church, uh, referring to everything that is not the Roman Catholic Church as you know, either pagans or Gnostic heretics. If there was any element of Christianity in, in their not Roman Catholicness, then they were Gnostic heretics. And if there was like no discernible sign of Christianity in it, then they were pagans. And, but it was their word, not the words of the people, the, the Celtics, the Nordic, the Greek polytheist, the Hindu, the pre-Islamic Arab mystic, the traditional African spiritual, you know, whatever, you name it, anything that isn't Roman Catholicism. So, anyway, that's why I'm saying that Gentile is not as rude as pagan. Just, uh, sorry, it took a little long to explain something that was just a passing comment. All right, where were we? Mm -hmm. There is no need for us to consider, is there, what? Where were we? Yes. There is no need for us to consider the wayward or the lazy who cannot be bothered to acquire an understanding of their world or seek with care to advance their fellow's welfare from which they will benefit a hundredfold after their last breath and only contribute to the human task, quote, with the tips of their fingers, end quote. But there is a kind of human spirit, parentheses, known to every spiritual director, end parentheses, for whom this difficulty assumes the shape and importance of a besetting and tumbling uncertainty, <clears throat> numbling, numbing, a numbing uncertainty, excuse me. Such spirits set upon interior unity become the victims of a veritable spiritual dualism. On the one hand, a very sure instinct mingled with their love for that which is, and their taste for life draws them to the joy of creating and of knowing. On the other hand, a higher will to love God above all else makes them afraid of the least division or deflection in their allegiances. In the most spiritual layers of their being, they experience a tension between the opposing ebb and flow caused by the drawing power of the two rival stars we spoke of at the beginning, God and the world. <sighs> Sorry, it's sidebar. It's, it was very interesting uh, relocating to India and, and getting involved in Hindu culture and discovering Lakshmi, the goddess divine, goddess of money. And uh, when, if somebody drops a coin, they pick it up and, and touch it to their forehead, maybe, maybe kiss, not actually kiss it because you get bacteria, but that much respect. Oh, I don't want to show disrespect to Lakshmi by letting her physical form, money, touch the floor. So, or if, uh, you know, you get out, you get out of a rickshaw and you pay them 50 rupees and they hand them the 50 rupees and they thank Lakshmi for this increase in prosperity. 
I don't know. Just just putting it out there. There's more than one way to look at things. Um, but yes, within the context of Catholicism and, of course, all forms of Christianity, according to what they say, um, that's, that's how you separate. It's God or mammon. You can't serve both God and mammon. But somehow those, like televangelists have figured out a way hypocrisy really <laughs> that's the way anyway so continuing depending on the uh, yes God in the world which of the two is to make itself more nobly adored depending on the greater or less vitality of the nature of the individual this conflict is in danger of finding its solution in one of the three following ways. Either the Christian will repress his taste for the tangible and force himself to confine his concerns to purely religious objects, and he will try to live, it, live in a world that he has divinized by banishing the largest possible number of earthly objects, or else... Harassed by that inward conflict which hampers him, he will dismiss the evangelical councils and decide to lead what seems to him a complete and human life. Or else, again, and this is the most usual case, he will give up any attempts to make sense of his situation. He will never belong wholly to God, nor even wholly to things, incomplete in his own eyes and insincere in the eyes of his fellows. He will gradually acquiesce in a double life. I am speaking, it should not be forgotten, from experience. We hear you, Tellier. Preach. For various reasons, all three of these solutions are to be feared. Whether we become distorted, disgusted, or divided, the result is equally bad. <laughs> Uh, and certainly contrary to that which Christianity should rightly produce in us, there is, without possible doubt, a fourth way out of the problem. It consists in seeing how, without making the smallest concession to nature, in quotes, but with a thirst for greater perfection, we can reconcile and provide mutual nourishment for the love of God and the healthy love of the world a striving toward detachment, and a striving toward the enrichment of our human lives. Four dots. Hopefully those were his dots. I would hate to think that someone in the editing process took something out of this book. Let us look at the two solutions that can be brought to the Christian problem of, quote, the divinization of human activity, end quote. The first partial, the second complete. All right, I'm going to close with that for today. This, this was interesting. This was very interesting. Um, all right. Uh, yeah. We'll, uh, we'll pick back up where we left off next time on the uh, Pierre Tellier Desjardins portion of Chicken Philosophy. And um, I hope you all have a wonderful day, week, month, year. And... Uh, May there be peace between you and us, and be you ready to come again when you are called. Is that the... No, that sounds weird when you're talking to humans. Um, may God bless you and keep you. May God cause his light to shine upon you. May God hold his hand toward you and bring you peace. No, I don't know. I'll just say... Uh,